Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this session of the CDFW Harvest Huddle Hour. My name is Jen Benedet and I am the CDFW statewide coordinator for the Hunter and Angler Recruit Retain Reactivate effort, also known as R3. So you, must, you might have noticed the R3 and the R3H3 um, for the event you signed up for today. That's what it stands for. So the Harvest Huddle Hour is a virtual program. It's intended for adult audiences just getting started or returning to their journey in hunting, fishing, foraging, and shooting sports. The information provided during these huddles is meant to help people break through information barriers and provide a confidence boost to participation. And today we have two exciting panelists that are gonna talk about various fisheries and fishing opportunities that we have across the Golden State. We hope that this R3H3 session will not only build your confidence to get started fishing in California, but also get you excited to try something new and even travel to different locations throughout the state to fish. So before we start, I have some quick housekeeping stuff uh, for all of you. So the first thing is, if you're new to Zoom, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There are a couple of view options, gallery and presenter. We recommend gallery view when many people are talking and presenter view for when individual people are talking. And you can feel free to go ahead and play around with it. Uh, whatever you select is not gonna affect the way other people see the, the screen. Uh, it's just individual. So at the end of the session, uh, there's gonna be an opportunity for audience Q&A. Uh, we'll be using the chat feature for this. And if you're not familiar with where the chat feature is, you can look at the bottom of your screen and there's a little sort of speech balloon. If you click on that, it'll open the dialog box. You'll be able to then type your question and hit enter to submit them to the moderators. So we try our best to get through as many questions as we can and questions can't be viewed by anyone watching uh, just by the moderators behind the scenes. So don't be afraid to ask questions. All of these sessions are also recorded and they're available on the department's R3 webpage within a few days. Um, that R3 webpage is wildlife.ca.gov backslash R3 and we'll drop that, that link into the chat box for everyone. You can find all of the past R3 H3 sessions on that webpage under the California Wild Kitchen tab. So if you're interested in seeing what we have done in the past, feel free to check it out. All right, let's get started. I wanna introduce our team today. So on the chat box, answering your questions and fielding them to our presenters during the live Q&A, we have Flower Moy and Max Fish. They're environmental scientists from our fisheries branch. And we have Tish Palamadesi and Robert Karam. They're from the R3 team out of the Office of Communications, Education and Outreach. So if anybody responds to you in the chat box, it will be one of those four. So we do our best to answer everyone's questions during the event. But if for some reason your question doesn't get answered, or if it's outside the scope of today's presentation, you can always submit your questions to us through our email, which is the statewide R3 program at wildlife.ca.gov. And we'll drop that email into the chat box as well. So let's get to our presenters today. So we have Farhat Bajalia. He's been with the Department of Fish and Wildlife since 2007, and he started as a scientific aide. At the time, he was assigned to the Lake Davis Northern Pike Eradication Project. The camaraderie he experienced during that time made him realize that CDFW was where he wanted to spend the rest of his career. He now works as a supervisor for the Heritage and Wild Trout Program, where he's responsible for coordinating inland trout efforts statewide. And then we also have Michael Mamola. He also works with the CDFW Statewide Heritage Wild Trout Program. He works to implement our state's strategic plan for trout management. He's worked for CDFW since 2006 and shocking, but his favorite pastime is trout fishing in the Sierras. <laughs> so thanks for Hot and Michael for being here today to share your experiences and your expertise. We'll jump right in. And if any questions pop up for anyone, remember that chat box feature is available to you. Right, take it away, Mike and Farhat. So California really is the golden state of angling. Um, one word can sum up exactly what makes angling in California the greatest in the nation, and that word is diversity. And when I say diversity, I'm talking about the number of species you could fish for, uh, the types of landscapes that you're going to visit while fishing, and the, the number of anglers that are out there. Um, many states claim to be the mantle of being the best place to fish in the country, but in reality, no state comes close to matching California in terms of angling diversity and opportunity. Inland waters, such as local ponds lake, and lakes and reservoirs, present uh, the option for anglers to target trout, bass, catfish, and sunfish in some of the most unique landscapes in the nation. Anadromous rivers, where fish ascend from the ocean to spawn, 
are great places for people to catch large salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, American shad, and striped bass. And usually within a short drive from a major metropolitan area. Um, and then to top it all off, California has an immense coastline where fish uh, of seemingly endless variety can be caught. But we're gonna get into more details on that in just a minute. First, let's uh, take a second to learn a little bit about our presenters, and we'll start by kicking it off to Farhat. Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Farhat Bajalia, and I've been working for the department for about 13 years, and I currently oversee the Heritage and Wild Trout Program. Uh, I grew up in the East Bay and have been fishing as long as I could remember. My favorite spots growing up were San Pablo Dam Reservoir and Lafayette Reservoir, where I would target trout and catfish. And then um, once in high school, I started taking fishing a little more seriously and got into tournament bass fishing. And I've been fortunate enough to fish many lakes and reservoirs in Northern California. And then since moving to Sacramento, I now consider myself more of an opportunistic angler and uh, will fish for whatever's biting, uh, depending on the season. Thanks, Farhat. And a little bit about me. My name's Michael Momola, and I've also been working for the department for roughly 13 years. Now I work for the Heritage and Wild Trout Program. I grew up in Sacramento and would spend the summers in my family's cabin up in the Sierras, fishing the trout streams and trout lakes that surrounded it. Um, as I grew older, I began fishing more and more for all different kinds of fish and different kinds of habitats from bass to catfish to carp and sunfish. Um, and now on top of loving to trout fish, I really am interested in fishing for our state's diverse coastal species. And I would also consider myself to be a trophy fish angler, focusing on size over quantity. So some of the stuff that we're gonna go over today includes the, the basic gear that you'll need to get started, um, some of the types of fish you can go fish for, um, what time of year you can catch those fish, and an interesting fishing tip for catching those fish uh, and a spot you can go check out. So getting started, you're gonna uh, need a, a basic fishing rod. It doesn't have to be super fancy or anything. You're either gonna choose from a bait caster rod, which is pic uh, pictured in the upper right hand corner of the slide or a spin caster rod. Um, it's really, it depends on preference. Uh, the bait caster is, typically a little easier for young kids to start off with. It has a little push button and tangles tend to be a little bit more limited. Um, you're also gonna need a basic tackle box uh, with a variety of hooks, weights, and bobbers. And aside from gear, you're gonna need to know a few basic fishing knots. Um, my favorite knot is the polymer knot, which is pictured in the middle of the slide. But one thing to keep in, in mind is once you know how to rig your gear, you could fish for any species. Um, and I also wanted to point out that there's going to be another R3 H3 talk that dives a little bit deeper in the basics of getting started. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Farhat. Uh, so where do you live in California? Well, regardless of your answer to that question, there are fishing opportunities available for you. If you live or play in the Sierras, there are trout fishing opportunities for you. If you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's striped bass fishing opportunities available for you. If you live in Southern California, there's so many urban ponds and lakes that have great catfish fishing available to you. Um, the point being there are always fish waiting to be caught regardless of where you live. And I guess one thing that I'll add is um, throughout this presentation, we're, we're going to hit home on those urban lakes and ponds. They offer a great opportunity for, for people of all skill level to get out there and fish. And everybody usually has a local pond or a lake close to where they live. So you don't have to go very far. That's a great point. So fishing, we're gonna start talk with uh, freshwater fishing. California has over 460,000 miles of rivers and streams. 
and over 20, uh, 27,000 ponds, lakes, and reservoirs. And what that really translates into is a lot of spots to catch fish. And the opportunity to catch fish is really limitless, regardless of your skill level. You know, that's really an important point that you mentioned, Farhat, regardless of skill level. I want to point out um, the woman on the upper left hand corner of your screen. She's a, at that time was a beginner angler. And that was one of her very first times out bass fishing. And that was on Lake Berryessa. And you can see she caught that really good sized fish. And it just goes to show you that even the very beginner can catch big fish in California. That's a good point, Michael. Um, Lake Berryessa is one of my favorite places to bass fish. And a um, uh, setup that I like to use is called the drop shot. And it's an easy setup for both beginners and experts alike. And you can catch uh, fish from, from small bass to large bass on it. And um, I like to tip my hook with um, a purple or pink worm. It, it really works well. So check out drop shot. Yeah, that's a great rig to use just about anywhere you can catch fish. Um, and we'll chat a little bit about marine fishing. California has over 1,100 miles of coastline, and this includes open ocean habitat, rocky shoreline, sandy beaches, tidal bays, and salt marsh habitats. And really one can't even begin to imagine just how many fish occupy that 1,100 miles of coastline. The point is whenever you go fishing and cast your line, you stand a good chance of catching something exciting. That's true, Michael. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I'll add is my sea legs aren't that great and I get super seasick, um, but that doesn't stop me from heading out and fishing the ocean. Um, there's tons of over-the-counter options, seasick meds out there. Um, and I get prescribed the seasick patch that goes behind my ear. And um, there's, there's a lot of experience that will, uh, a lot of options that will make your experience more comfortable. Yeah, you always want to maximize your comfort when you're going out spending a day on the ocean. Definitely. That's a good point. Um, and so before we jump into each individual species, just keep in mind that this presentation is going to be posted to the R3H3 website. So don't feel pressured to memorize everything we're talking about. The uh, presentation is going to be up there for you. And now let's take a moment to start jumping into some of our species. And the first one we're going to start with is trout. And there are over a dozen species of trout in California that range from the very common rainbow trout, which you may be familiar with, to the beautiful high elevation golden trout. And the department stocks many of these trout so they can be caught all year long. And to catch these fish, try using night crawlers or dough bait fished off the bottom. That's uh, that dough bait that's pictured there in the center image. Um, or try casting small spinner spoons or even flies to generate a strike. Those are great bait options, but you know, I'll, I'll say chartreuse dough bait with a little bit of glitter is arguably the best option to catch trout. Now, I, I know that's, that's Farhat's go-to, but I gotta tell you, my go-to is rainbow dough bait with a little bit of sparkle in it. I put more fish on the scoreboard using that technique than I think anything else. So uh, that's what I would recommend to you. I think rainbow does have a little bit of chartreuse in it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so lakes and reservoirs are an excellent place to catch trout. Uh, many lakes and reservoirs are just within or just outside city limits. So it's a short distance that you have to travel to get to them. Um, they, many of them provide ADA access. Um, they have docks that you can fish off of. They have boat rentals. A lot of them even sell basic tackle. So if you don't have what you think you need when you get there, you can usually pick it up. Um, they're affordable. And what's great is they're usually in a park-like setting. So if you also enjoy things like uh, hiking or bird watching, um, you can usually combine those activities uh, with fishing as well. And one of the nice things, this 
photograph here is Lafayette Reservoir, is when you're fishing for trout, you also have the opportunity to catch uh, other species as well, sunfish or bass. Yeah, Lafayette Reservoir really is great. Um, it's located in the East Bay, right outside of downtown Lafayette. And um, once you get to the reservoir, you wouldn't realize how close you are to a, a, a city. Um, you're surrounded by oaks and the lake is really beautiful. Um, there's lots of docks, so you usually could find a spot to fish. Um, and when the kids get bored, there's a really good playground there too. Nice. So sunfish, there's, uh, there's multiple species of sunfish in California, ranging from the very common bluegill to the large black crappie. And these fish can be caught all year long, virtually in all inner city and lower elevation waters. Um, to catch sunfish, try using crickets or red worms under a bobber, or you can also cast uh, small micro jigs or flies. Yeah, um, those are good tips, Farhat. And it's also good to remember that sunfish can be an excellent, what's called a gateway fishery for kids um, just entering the sport for the first time. Sunfish can usually be caught in large numbers and pretty quickly too. Um, on top of that, they can also be fun for the season angler as well because they can grow to pretty big sizes um, as shown in that readier sunfish photo on the upper left-hand side of the screen. That's a really big sunfish. So um, again, urban ponds. So small weedy urban ponds, uh, such as Howe Park Pond in Sacramento, which is pictured in the slide, um, can be a great place for any angler, uh, regardless of age or skill set to catch sunfish. Um, all you gotta do is cast your bait along the weed edges or under docks. Uh, to catch these uh, pan-sized fish. Sunfish often wait in these areas because it's a good spot for them to ambush prey as it swims by. Um, and once you cast into these areas, you shouldn't have to wait very long for a strike, which will come in the form of a twitch at the end of your rod or you'll see your, your bobber go under. Yeah, those are, those are good tips. Um, I'll mention just from personal experience having fished fish this pond before, I like to focus my uh, sunfish fishing around docks and woody structure and things like that, uh, especially if there's some shade provided from the sun, those sunfish like bluegill will stack. You can get a fish a minute fishing under that, that kind of habitat. That's a really good point. Um, the only other thing that I'll add is um, the department stocks these urban ponds pretty heavily during the winter months. So um, there's opportunity to catch trout as well, depending on the type of year. Yeah, that's true. That's one of the nice things Farhad about, about just about oh many of our state's waters is there's not just one thing to catch. There's lots of things to catch when you go out there. It's not just trout, it's trout and bass. It's trout and sunfish. And let's talk a little bit about bass. Um, there are multiple species of bass in California that range from the colder water smallmouth bass to the large and aggressive largemouth bass. These bass can be caught all year long in many of our states, lakes, and reservoirs. And to catch these bass, try using live bait or artificial lures such as crankbaits or soft plastic worms jigs or even topwater lures that imitate frogs. Those are all good options. Um, and I'll just mention as much as I enjoy exploring California's larger lakes when I'm bass fishing, some of my best days fishing for bass have been at those urban ponds closest to home. The action can be pretty exciting and occasionally you can hook into a giant. You make a great point about fishing those kind of urban waters or those waters that are close to home. The picture of the woman holding the bass on the bottom left hand side of your screen, she caught that bass in a small lake that was close to home. She didn't have to travel long distance to a big reservoir and go out fishing on a boat. She was able just to fish right from shore and catch that nice fish. So it just goes to show you, you don't have to travel far from home. And when bass fishing, I often like to fish weedy lakes such as Lake Natoma. 
as they're usually rich and diverse in both food and can grow large bass. When I fish from shore, I like to locate structure and cast to that. And structure in this case, often being fallen trees or submerged logs or rocks, or even vegetation that's starting to grow out of the water. Usually bass will be nearby these areas waiting to ambush their favorite prey. And in the case of Lake Natoma, that's crayfish and minnows. And the only thing that I'll, I'll really add about fishing weedy lakes is it, it, they can be kind of challenging for the beginner because you might be hooking up on, on weeds frequently. So you want to make sure that you're either using uh, a weedless bass setup or make sure that your hook's kind of buried in your bait a little deeper. And that should help prevent you from getting hooked up on weeds all the time. That's a good point. That weedless setup really can be a lifesaver and can really turn what would normally be a frustrating experience in snagging lots of weeds into a really enjoyable experience catching lots of fish. Good point. So catfish and carp. California offers an excellent opportunity to catch uh, multiple species of catfish and carp with relative ease. Um, these fish can be caught all year long by the beginner and expert alike. And usually all it takes is a hook tipped with chicken liver, sardines, or night crawlers. Um, I guess I'll say the bait might be smelly, but the payoff can be big. You know, you're totally right, Farhawk. And I remember this time I was fishing this creek called Dry Creek for catfish, and I was using cut sardines. And I was thinking to myself, man, this smell is never coming off of me. But uh, just when I was thinking that, my rod, you know, it, it, it bent over and I set the hook on what ended up being a five pound channel catfish. So, you know, smelly baits, big payoff. So true. So sloughs can be a pretty fantastic place for the angler to catch uh, both catfish and carp. Um, sloughs are typically or sloughs are typically slow moving and provide ample habitat for these fish to live and hide. And the water is usually pretty murky, but don't let that deter you because neither catfish or carp require clear water to find your bait. Both of these uh, fish excel in finding smelly baits in murky water. And aside from fishing sloughs, both catfish and carp can be caught pretty much virtually anywhere from lakes and reservoirs to urban ponds. Yeah, uh, that's a great point, Farhat. And another, another thing to mention is that if you live in like the greater Sacramento or Stockton or Central Valley area in general, there's a lot of sloughs right nearby you. So, you know, you don't have to travel long distances. That's another point we want to make in this presentation is you don't have to go a long distance to find fish. Um, in fact, this slough right here, Prospect Slough, I'll go out fishing just right after work and, and you know, get a couple hours of fishing in, maybe get some carp and catfish, you know, before it gets too dark. Sure. I guess the, the last point about sloughs that I'll make is you never know what you're going to catch. Um, you might be fishing for, for catfish, but you could also hook up uh, a big striped bass or even a sturgeon sometimes. So um, it could be really fun. Yeah, definitely. So anadromous fish, there are over five species of anadromous fish in California that include the Chinook salmon, steelhead, striped bass, white sturgeon, and American shad. These fish can be found in the state's major rivers and delta nearly all year long, giving anglers a chance to catch a big fish no matter the time of year. To catch salmon and steelhead, try using large spinners and spoons. I like chartreuse or pink colored ones. And to catch striped bass and sturgeon, try using pile worms, cut sardines, or bucktail jigs. And I'll say that uh, striped bass are actually one of my favorite species to fish for. And I typically target them in the American and Sacramento rivers, as well as throughout the Delta. Um, bait is always an excellent option, but my favorite way to catch striped bass is using swim baits and top, top water lures. Uh, hold on tight because when you're fishing swim baits or top water lures, uh, you, have, you stand a chance of catching a really big fish. 
Oh, that's so true. Especially on places like the American and Sacramento River, there are some big striped bass waiting for you. Definitely. So anadromous species such as Chinook salmon and steelhead will ascend from the ocean and swim up the lower American River, giving anglers living in the greater Sacramento area the opportunity at catching a really large fish just outside your front door. What you're going to want to do is look for deep holes where these fish will hang out. This is where they're gathering strength to swim up the rapids and riffles that dot the upper stretches of this river. You want to cast your lure into the upper reaches of a deep hole and retrieve it as it drifts downstream, taking care not to let it hit the bottom. That's where snags happen. A snag is where you lose your lure on something. This will allow your lure to be presented to the maximum amount of fish every cast while avoiding losing your, your lures. That's a, that's a really good point. And if you're fishing bait, you wanna make sure that um, you're just bouncing your weight off the bottom and making sure that it doesn't drag along the, the, the bed of the river. Um, mm -hmm. And that'll help you avoid snags as well. Yeah, very true. So now we're gonna move on to the ocean. Um, the first species that we're going to talk about are rockfish, and there are over two dozen species of rockfish in California's coastal waters. Um, these fish can be caught with relative ease uh, up and down the entire coast from Mexico to Oregon. Uh, to catch these fish, you're going to try using uh, shrimp flies, jigs, and swim baits, um, or you could even use cut baits such as squid or sardines. Those are all great uh, baits or lure options. I've used uh, shrimp flies a lot in the past to great success. Um, but lately when I target rockfish, I like to use large jigs, um, like the one pictured in, in the center image, uh, to capture larger species such as the Boccaccio rockfish, which is shown on the upper right hand side of your screen. So really nice fish, Michael. Sometimes you got to fish big to catch big. That's very true. So the most productive way to target rockfish is uh, by fishing large rocky islands, such as the Farallon Islands or other underwater rocky structure. Uh, to get out there, I like to charter a boat out of San Francisco, Half Moon Bay, Bodega Bay, or even Santa Barbara. And, and the point is, regardless of uh, where you're located in California, your closest marina should have some options for you. Once out there, I'll drop my lure or bait all the way to the bottom, um, which could be well over 100 feet deep. And once I feel the bottom, I'll uh, reel up on the reel a, a few, few cranks so my bait or weight just hits the bottom or bounces off the bottom, and that'll help you avoid snags. Um, rockfish will hang out in the crevices of the rocks waiting to ambush your bait as it swims by. So uh, once you hook one, you're gonna feel some added weight to your line. You're gonna to wanna to set the hook and just start a st uh, steady re retrieve. Yeah, that steady retrieve is really, really critical um, because sometimes you'll catch a really small rockfish and another species of fish called a lingcod will actually swallow that fish. And a slow, steady retrieve will allow you to get that lingcod to the surface. It's really fun when that happens. Yeah. And that's a perfect segue into our next species, which is the lingcod. So lingcod grow to very large sizes and live on the bottom, the rocky bottom, in both shallow and deep water. Uh, lingcod can come in a variety of colors, from browns to whites and red it, reds to even a brilliant turquoise blue. To catch lingcod, try using lead jigs or swim baits to trigger strikes from this very large fish. And I really like to use uh, swim, baits, swim baits to target large lingcod. Um, these baits imitate a wounded uh, bait fish perfectly and lingcod can't seem to resist them. Yeah, that's so true. So lingcod love the rocky shore of the California coastline. While they can be found in deeper waters during parts of the year, during the spawn, they actually move into shallower water and can become susceptible to the shorebound angler. Um, but there's some points I wanna touch on here, which I think are critical if you're thinking about going out and fishing from the, the rocky shoreline. And 
that's to remember that safety needs to be your number one concern. Um, the rocks can be really slippery. They can be covered in, in algaes and seaweeds sometimes, and waves can cause you to lose your footing. And it's important to remember that no, no fish is worth you, you risking your life over. And to avoid that risk, you can rent a spot on one of our state's many charter boats. Um, and these charter boats will take you right to the very best spot to catch lingcod. Good point, Michael, safety first. So the next uh, type of fish we're gonna talk about are surf perch. And I refer to surf perch as the bluegill of the sea because um, they're really fun to catch. Uh, they hang out in schools and they could range from uh, small to really big, like the one in the upper left-hand corner. Um, there are many different uh, species of surf perch that inhabit the sandy and rocky shoreline of California, and they can be caught all year long from piers and the beach with relative ease. Uh, to catch surf perch, try using uh, live pile worms or even small, small curly-tailed grubs um, that mimic wounded bait fish. And just so you know, the gear that you use for bass and trout are really good to catch surf perch as well. You don't need to go to the beach or the pier with a giant surf rod to catch these surf perch. Um, your bass or trout rod will work just fine. Yeah, that's that's a great tip, Farhat. Um, one of the places I like to fish for surf perch are off our state's many piers. And these piers provide structure which attracts small shrimp and small fish, which in turn attracts the big surf perch that come in to feed on them. And that by hyper concentration of fish makes fishing pretty exciting because it's not like you're fishing for just one fish or two fish. You can sometimes get into a, a, a whole mess of them. That's true. And that reminds me, Michael, we still need to put our uh, Pinole Pier trip on the calendar. That's true. I, we won't forget it. We'll put it on there. So sandy beaches uh, along the North Coast are a great spot to catch a large number of surf perch. When you're casting, you're going to want to look for troughs between waves. And troughs are the deeper spots that will be holding uh, fish waiting to nab your bait. Again, you're going to want to try to use pile worms uh, or those uh, motor oil curly tailed grubs. And you'll be amazed what large surf perch will go after. And identifying those troughs can be a little tricky at first, but the more time you spend out there, um, the more you'll get used to it. And if you just Google um, fishing for surf perch, there's some more uh, tips and techniques on how to identify those troughs. Yeah, finding those troughs, that's the, that's the critical, critical part. So flatfish, um, there are multiple species of flatfish that live in California's tidal bays and ocean depths. This fishery can be highly seasonal. So check with your local CDFW office for information about the best season to go. Um, catching flatfish such as halibut can be really exciting. And to accomplish that, try drifting live sardines or casting or trolling, um, which is like dragging behind a boat, uh, medium-sized swim baits that imitate a live sardine. And, uh, you know, there are a number of species of flatfish. Um, another one is called a sand dab. It's about the size of your hand, which can be very easy for the beginner to catch. Uh, to catch these small flatfish, try casting pile worms or small strips of squid off the sandy beaches. And oftentimes you can catch. Uh, a whole a whole group of sand abs in, in one go. Tidal bays. So flatfish such as halibut and sand abs inhabit shallow, sandy, muddy parts of the San Francisco Bay. They can be caught by the boat and pier angler alike with many big halibut being caught by the shorebound angler every year. 
Uh, first, you're going to want to check the tides to ensure you're fishing an incoming tide. This is the best time to catch the flatfish. Uh, then you'll want to cast your bait, which can be frozen sardines or anchovies off the pier or shore. Um, you're going to want to wait for a bounce or kind of a twitch to the end of your rod. That's the flatfish biting. And then you're going to set the hook. And here's one of the, the really exciting things about fishing for flatfish is you never really know what you're going to catch. You could be fishing for uh, halibut and sand dabs and end up catching leopard sharks or striped bass or bat rays. In fact, you, sometimes you never even know what you're going to catch. That's, uh, that's so true, Michael. Um, when I'm fishing tidal bays such as San Francisco Bay, I really, I really consider it like the, the hometown buffet of fishing spots because you could be bouncing bottom for halibut and then all of a sudden hook into uh, the striped bass of your lifetime or even something cool like a huge shark. Yeah, yep, definitely. So next we're gonna talk about open ocean fishing. Um, there's uh, over a dozen species of open ocean sport fish found in California that range from large striped marlin to albacore tuna and many in between. Um, open ocean sport fish are highly migratory and can be caught seasonally, but you're primarily going to fish for these fish uh, down in Southern California where the water's a little warmer. And to catch these fish, it really is best to charter one of our state's many sport fishing boats. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. And the nice thing about chartering a fishing experience is that the gear is typically provided for you and there'll be crew on board the boat that can lend a helping hand. It really makes it so you can be the absolute beginner angler and hook into a fish of a lifetime. So when you're out there fishing the open sea, you might think it looks like a, a desert in blue, but in fact, the open seas are rich with, with different species of fish to fish for. And these fish make long migrations across continents in search of food and mates. Uh, you could fortunately catch them right outside of our state's Southern California ports out of Los Angeles or San Diego. And by chartering one of these boats, um, the captain will take you exactly where you need to go and use the, the right baits and the right techniques to be successful. Yeah. So a, a great diversity, that is the message that we want to send with this presentation. And there are three important things to remember about fishing in California. First, the diversity of angling opportunities in California really dwarfs one's expectations. From the varying landscapes to numerous species, there's something to target for everyone. Uh, second, there's never a bad time to go fishing. Uh, regardless of season, fish are active and they're waiting to be caught. Uh, just right outside your front door in, in a lot of cases. And lastly, there's something for everybody. From beginner to expert angler, there's a unique experience to be had for all. That's true. And I'll just add one last tip. Um, don't be afraid to, to contact one of our uh, regional offices. Uh, our staff are super friendly. And unlike the fish, they don't bite. And uh, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll tell you where the fish are biting and where to catch them. Um, and it'll help you better plan your next fishing trip. Yep, that's true. We've got uh, a great team of people waiting to help you. So it was really great speaking with you all today. And hopefully we've given you enough information to get started and you could go plan your next fishing adventure. Yeah, and thank you for everyone for taking the time to be with us today. And let's open it up for questions from the audience. Sounds good. Thank you, gentlemen. That was really great. I'm sure your discussion triggered lots of questions. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and open it up. It's about 12.42 right now. So we have about 20 minutes or so that we can use for Q&A. So everybody who's listening in, uh, a lot of people have already submitted questions, but if you have questions that have come up or, or haven't been covered, uh, feel free to drop them into the chat box uh, for the next few minutes and we'll go ahead and weigh in with our panelists. So um, our 
background moderators have done a really great job of answering questions as they've come in throughout your presentations. But I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, both of you some of those questions. So sure. if you were the question asker and already received a response, um, this might be repeat information, but there's some, some stuff that was asked that I thought would be good for the larger group. So um, I just took some notes. So let's go through them. Um, so I've watched YouTube videos, but still don't understand how to fish from the beach. How do you cast it out there and not have it come back with the wave? And what tide is the best to catch surf perch in? And how does your line stay straight? Any words of wisdom? Um, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, is using the appropriate amount of weight based on the conditions out there. Um, and sometimes with surf perch, I'll let my weight kind of move with the waves and then you reel in and you'll recast. So um, if you're using enough weight, you can kind of plunk it out there and let it soak. But if you're trying to keep your bait moving, um, you'll just kind of roll it with the waves and then reel in when you're ready to reel in and cast again. Yeah, that's a good tip, Farhat. Um, there's another method that, that involves using something called a, a pyramid sinker you know, um, and where you just cast it out, you find that trough that Farhat was talking about a little bit earlier, you cast it out and you're using enough weight that it just stays pinned in the sand. And, uh, and you just find that trough and you, you're basically just, you're casting and waiting for the fish to come to you. It can be a little slower um, fishing technique because obviously you're waiting for the fish to come to you, but it, it can also be successful. Um, you know, there's, uh, when you stop by some of your local tackle shops on the coast, they'll sell all those kind of weights and things like that. And they'll have some good tips on very specific parts of a very specific beach to go to. Um, and they can point you on a map for that. So don't be afraid to take advantage of kind of that local knowledge um, that those, those more local tackle shops have. Good point. Perfect. Another question was, what is the best hook for doe bait to prevent fish from being deeply hooked and increase survivability for catch and release? Um, to increase survivability, I would recommend a small circle hook. Circle hooks usually allow fish to get caught in the corner of the mouth, um, which will allow you to unhook them really easy for, for catch and release. Perfect. Yeah, that's a, a great option, Farhat. And I would recommend if you go to your tackle shop, look for them in a size six to eight. It's going to be a little bit on the smaller side, um, but it'll allow you to, to bury it in that dough bait um, so the fish doesn't feel the hook. And bite. Um, you could also go barbless. Um, it'll affect your ability to land fish, but if you're really concerned about releasing them, um, barbless is a good option too. So what do you mean when you said you guys referred to fishing off the bottom or off the top? Uh, what does that mean? And how do I know uh, how to decide which to do? So I guess fishing off the bottom is when your, your weight or your jig is physically touching the bottom of the lake or stream that you're fishing in. Um, and fishing off the top, um, an example of that's going to be like, um, a top water bait that floats on the surface that causes surface action that um, might attract a, a big bass or a, a striped bass. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify some of the gear that you mentioned? You mentioned a bottom rig and a sliding weight. How do I know what that is and is it called different things? So the sliding weight is referred to as an egg sinker, and it's it's pretty much shaped like a, like an egg almost, and it'll have a hole in the middle and that you slide your line through. Perfect. Um, this is a good one. When you recommend someone, uh, what would you recommend someone do when they buy their first rod and reel setup to get over the anxiety of asking the questions that you need to know to the salesperson? I don't want to sound dumb. Oh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't worry about, about sounding dumb at all. When you go into tackle shops, they're, they're 
friendly people and there's they're they're not going to judge you um for wanting to get started and get active in the fishery um i would say that that um you're looking for a, a beginner type rod, something for an entry into the sport, but something where you wanna maximize the number of species you can target. And that's gonna kind of allow the person working in the tackle shop to kind of put together an image of kind of what would be best for you. Um, so for me, if I was going in for the very first time being a trout angler or a bass angler, I would say I'm looking for a rod that could handle both bass and trout. What might be the best, best option for that? And, and they're going to kind of tee you up on that. Or if you, and, and like Farha mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you have a rod that's built for trout and bass, you really have it de facto have a rod that's good for just about anything you know they can handle all kinds of stuff and i'll just add that people at tackle shops work at tackle shops because they like fishing and once you get someone who likes fishing talking it's hard to get them to stop so um i wouldn't be too anxious yeah they'll, they'll be excited to help you you know so similar sort of question uh what size length and kind of rods and reels do you recommend for beginners fishing all of these different kinds of fish is there one setup you would suggest to get the most species knowing that beginners aren't going to be able to buy a bunch of different setups um so i guess i would recommend a six and a half foot medium action rod that breaks apart into two pieces um and i don't know a, a a good, a decent reel. You don't want to go uh, too cheap on either because once you have a good rod, it'll last you a while. Um, so you don't need a, you don't need a very big rod, six and a half feet enough, and you want to match it with, with the appropriate size reel. Yeah. And when you're talking about uh, reels, you know, you don't, you don't have to go to the extremes in getting one, um, you know, a good, good reel, you might be talking, 20, 30 bucks or something like that for an entry level one. Mm -hmm. I would probably say spool up with six to eight pound test line. That's going to allow you to catch um, bass, trout, sunfish, surf perch, uh, carp, catfish. It's, it's really going to be kind of like your, your multi-tool, so to speak, to do the maximum amount of things. We have a lot of questions. This is really great. I love the participation. Uh, this must be a good topic. Sometimes some of these, we don't get as many, as many questions. So uh, we have somebody that would like to know what is a leader. I've been told I need one for bass fishing, but what do you actually recommend? Um, so you'll have your main line that is on your reel. And then you'll, so, so for bass fishing on your main line, you might have braided line. And for a leader, you might want to use um, a clear monofilament line. And so you're going to attach the mono leader to the braid with a swivel. Um, I don't know, that might be a little bit complex, but what, what do you think, Michael? I would, I would actually say that a, a leader is for bass fishing is not necessary for you to catch fish. It's something that, that can be um, an addition to a more complex uh, form of line called that braid that Farhat was talking about. But I'm gonna be, be honest with you, the line that you spool up on your rod, you can attach directly to your lure usually with like some yeah. kind of snap swivel or something like that. So, so you can easily put on one lure to the next, but the line that you've got, I agree. should be good to go. Good point. I like that. Uh, just kind of, this wasn't submitted from the public, but maybe this would be a good 
uh, segue to just let people know where they can maybe find uh, terms, terminology that we're using. Um, you know, if, if you can easily Google these terms and a lot of them will come up. Um, there's also lots of YouTube videos and, and other resources that are available to learn the terminology of different tackle. Um, it can be really confusing. And sometimes certain things have 50 different names, which doesn't make it any easier. But do either of you have additional recommendations of kind of where to send people if they have questions about what things are called? I, I, guess, I guess one thing that I will say is if I had one fishing setup, um, I, it would be the slide sinker setup where you have an egg weight, a uh, swivel, a leader and a hook, and you could fish for virtually anything anywhere with that one, one setup. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, that setup is the go-to setup for trout, sunfish, uh, surf perch. Um, you can even size that exact same setup up, get a little heavier weight, but still use the same setup and go fishing off the rocks um, or off a pier jetty. That's your same rig for catfish it's 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 your catch-all rig um, and in terms of finding terminology i would also recommend going to our cdfw's web page link on fishing in the city um, there are some tutorials that are there for how to rig your lines for catfish and trout and um, it does provide some extra information on knots and how to set up a sliding sinker and, and bobbers and uh, things of that nature. Perfect, that's great. Um, do you have any tips to get the smell of dough bait off your fingers or, and what can you do when it starts to dry out? <laughs> you just gotta start loving the smell and just not worry about it. <laughs> uh, Dawn dish soap, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, as somebody that uses dough bait pretty regularly um, when trout fishing, uh, just wash your hands in the, in the lake as fast as you use it or be like me and learn to love it. It, it, um, <laughs> the, um, in terms of when your bait starts to dry out, it does have a shelf life. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, when mine starts to dry out, I usually just purchase a new one. Um, but make sure when you're using it, that the key to, it will last a long time. I mean, the shelf life is a long time. It's years for this dough bait. And, but the key is, is immediately thin it upon you know, taken out a little bit to use, you screw that cap back on real tight mm -hmm. and put it back in your tackle box, get it out of the sun. Sometimes you forget about it, leave it out, out for a half a day. It'll start to start to harden and, and then you get into some trouble. So just cap it, put it away as soon as you're done with it. That'll save you. Are there any programs that the department offers to learn how to fish? I mean, I know you just mentioned fishing in the city, and but this question came in before before you mentioned that. Yeah, um, I would recommend uh, fishing in the city uh, as a good entry level um, program to get involved with. Um, we do stock. Um, our urban ponds on a pretty regular basis. Fishing in the city can provide rods for day use. Um, they have a limited number of them. Um, what I would recommend doing is, because we have fishing in the city coordinators, is going to the link on the web page uh, for fishing in the city. It'll give you the contact information for those people and reach out to them, and they'll be able to set you up with um, when the upcoming tutorials are, uh, things of that nature. And I'll, I'll say, if, if you go on the Fishing in the City website and the calendar looks a little lean right now, I think it's because um, of COVID restrictions. But once those are, are lifted, um, the calendar should populate pretty quickly. Yeah. Right. So uh, people are asking where they can fish without a license. Um, I think all state peers, ocean peers are, are 
or you could fish without a license. But in terms of like inland waters, you need a fishing license. Right. There's yeah. also two free fishing days a year. Yeah. Right? yeah. And if you had questions about like us, a, a specific peer, um, we have regional fish and wildlife offices. I would reach out to that regional fish and wildlife office if you have concerns one way or the other, and they'll be able to tell you definitively um, for that specific peer uh, if one is required or not. Perfect. And then it's about two minutes till, so we'll take maybe two more questions. Um, we'll go with what are the best times to fish for trout and bass early morning or sunset? And is it possible to catch fish midday? Oh yeah, it's definitely possible to catch fish midday. I mean, maybe that's kind of a two part question. So maybe I'll handle the trout part far hop. You can handle the bass part. Sure. Okay. So, um, you can catch trout all day long. Obviously there are optimum times early in the morning, in the evening around the dusk bite, if there happens to be some kind of emergence of aquatic insects that those fish are keyed in on. Now what I'm talking about right now are wild fish. Okay, so wild fish are really keyed in on their natural environment. They have really set feeding times and feeding patterns and matching those is gonna be critical to your success. What we also have um, for the beginner and expert alike are hatchery propagated fish. And those fish are less picky when it comes time to what time of the day they wanna feed. And, and really when it comes to them, it, it's an all day experience. I mean, I've personally been out fishing three o'clock in the afternoon, August, it's 115 degrees and I caught a trout. So it's, it, for those hatchery fish, one of the nice things about it is, is it becomes a fishery for when you can get out there and experience it. You don't have to necessarily wake up at the crack of dawn or take off work early in order to get out there and experience it. It's, it's something that, that you can do at your leisure. And um, Farad, I'll kick it to you for the, the bass part. Sure. I would say in terms of bass, it's pretty similar. Um, I used to be the crack of dawn angler, and uh, I'm less willing to do that now. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say like early morning, early evening are probably the, the best times to go fishing for bass. But again, like you could catch them all day. Um, Bass will typically hang a little shallower in the morning and evening, uh, which brings them closer to shore and a little easier to cast to. But as the day heats up and you start getting to the afternoon time, they'll just go a little deeper. So if you could target them in deeper water, um, you could still be successful. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, I thought we had enough time for two questions, but we're actually out of time. So I guess that was the last question. So our time is up. If uh, you didn't get your, an your question answered, please remember that you can always find resources on the R3 webpage that might help you find answers. That link has been inserted into the chat earlier, but maybe uh, one of the background moderators will, will reinsert that link for everyone. Um, you can also email us your questions uh, or any, any issues that you come up with uh, as you start to fish, and we will always try to get you some, some answers uh, and resources. So our next few R3H3 sessions include Steps to Becoming a Hunter on March 5th, First Cast, How to Become a California Angler on March 19th, and our very first shooting sports topic is going to be offered on April 2nd. So right now, uh, registration is open and live for the Steps to Becoming hunt a Hunter event on March 5th. You'll find it the same way you found this one. Uh, you can find it on the R3 calendar off the R3 page in our Hunter Angler update emails uh, and through our social media link. Uh, and also, you, when you go to register for R3H3, it's going to send you to a list of other virtual events from our Advanced Hunters Ed program. And there's some hunting clinics on there if you're interested in those. Feel free to sign up for them as well. So I think with that, I just want to give a big shout out to our presenters. Thank you guys so much for your time and all of the effort that you put into your presentations. Um, we really enjoy having people join us for these sessions and we hope that they're useful to everyone listening. Thanks so much for the background people who were answering everyone in the chat box and to our IT support. 
And of course, to all the participants, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate you fishing and hunting and foraging. And we hope to see you in the outdoors. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.